morning, Church of the Living God. Amen. Amen. How many of you were here in 2002? Okay, I can see some hands. You should be familiar with me. I'm not a stranger. You are my witnesses to that. Let me request you to delve into the scriptures right away. Okay. Our presentation this morning is entitled Love as Revealed on the Cross. The love of Christ as revealed on the cross of Calvary. We will begin by reading a text, that's Matthew chapter 26, verse number 36 to verse number number 39. You will see that this discourse is basically about uh, the events that befell our Savior in this last week. Verse number 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here. This is the King James Version. Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Verse 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, O oh, Lord. But as thou wilt. These are the words of Christ himself. Let's bow our heads and pray once again. Dear Father in heaven, we are not sufficient to expound on the words of Jesus, our creator. We are frail, we are human, sinful. May you descend in your capacity and share the word for the sake of the congregation. Guide my lips and use me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My brothers and sisters, in this short uh, pericope, we already meet with Jesus in his last week. He is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. What surprises most of uh, scholars, if I may say, is that Jesus is already dying before the nails and the spears. Jesus appears to be sorrowing unto death. That's what he, he tells us from the reading. He says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. If you go to Luke chapter 22, around verse number 44, reading the same event, Luke put some, some things there that Matthew does not mention here. He says, then Jesus was sweating something that appeared like blood. Jesus is already oozing out, blood oozing out of him. But this is before the cross. This is before Judas interferes with that which God had already planned before him. I feel pity for him, Judas, because he became an accomplice of something that heaven had already designed. It's not very much uh, good for us, my brothers and sisters, to, you know, sometimes 
engage in business that does not belong to us. We mess up and end up betraying the one who is our savior. Jesus is already sorrowing to death. Jesus is already dying. Somebody says Jesus was here facing that climax of his mission. This is what he came for. And even in our study today, as I was listening, as we're going through, you know, we don't give because we don't love. Because when we love, we, can, we will not be asked to give. Giving is a practice of those who are loving. No one should be coerced to love. And in a relationship where there is cohesion, there is tantamount for divorce and separation and so forth. May I just request you to remember that Jesus loves you this morning. Jesus has done all for you, everything, to the point that he could carry your Lord, the Lord of your weaknesses, that which you yourself even don't want people to know, that which embarrasses you, that which you cannot fathom or think about, was loaded on him in the Garden of Gethsemane. What do we say for what Jesus did for us? He was here experiencing not, uh, you will agree with me, he was not experiencing any physical, physical pain here. But he was experiencing an inward internal pain, so great, so deep, so intense, that it was taking away his life. This is before the cross, before the nails, the hammers, before the spears. before the courts of Cephas and his colleagues, before his appearance in front of Pilate. He was entering the realm of darkness, plunged under darkness of the second death by the sin of the entire world. Hence the words of John, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Loaded upon him. Isaiah portrays it in a marvelous way if you look at Isaiah chapter 53. If you can rush there with me, let's read together the wonderful uh, picture that he puts there for our Savior. You can read the whole chapter, but let's just begin on verse number seven. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers, and is dumb. So he opened not, not his mouth. That's number eight. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? Because he's from everlasting to everlasting, no generation. Continue reading. For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. 
This is the path that Jesus is traversing in the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse number 11 in the same chapter, Isaiah says, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify how many? Many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Praise God for Jesus. He doesn't embarrass us. Even though he knows what engulfs your mind, he doesn't allow it to jump out and appear on your forehead. He restrains it and keeps it there because he loves you. He loves me. To a point where he comes down to relieve me of that behavior, that uh, lifestyle of sin, that propensity. He comes down and uh, helps me to understand that I am a sinner. You will only understand how sinful you are, my brother, my sister, as you behold Jesus on the cross. Isaiah gives it a very wonderful picture. If you can have time, read the whole chapter. As I've said, you will see that Jesus is portrayed as a suffering servant. Suffering to the point of death. Grieving for me and for you. He is feeling condemned already. Hence his plea with the Father. Because in him, he is already loaded with him the sin of the world, loaded on him. From Adam up to the last person, just think about that. I'm not very sure how many are we in the world today. In our country, I think it's last year when census was done, but I think we are around 15 million by now in, in Zimbabwe. In the world, the last I knew, we were around 7 billion. Okay? And I heard, and I, I think I read in some records that uh, now they estimate that we are around 8 billion. 8 billion. That was before COVID. The sin of the world upon Jesus. Fathers and mothers, boys and girls, loaded upon Christ. And because Calvary is timeless, the redemption story does not, is not ours now. The promise was not given to us. As you know, my brothers and sisters, the promise was first given to those who were first created. Those who committed sin first are the ones that received the redemption promise first. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. If we were going to stay a little bit there, you were going to see that the promise is a wonderful one. Because the one who is to come with salvation is not going to be born in an ordinary way. In a way that we all understand. Maybe let's go there, Genesis chapter 3 for you to just enjoy what our Savior has done for us. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Listen carefully as we read, my dear brothers and sisters. And between thy seed, thy seed and what? You know, out there where I come from, you want to move with the congregation. Pardon me if it's not the culture here, <laughs> okay? But as you are welcoming me, would you just uh, indulge me by responding as we move together? <laughs> okay. Okay, let me reread that. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and what? Come on, church. And what? Yes. Whose seed? 
Whose seat is this one? The seed is hers, according to the text. The seed is not his. The seed is hers. When God wanted to redeem us from our predicament of evil, the one who was supposed to come to exonerate you from the pit of hell, he was not supposed to be born in a normal way. When God wants to redeem somebody, the seed does not come from him but from her. This is beyond science. Biology cannot agree and does not understand this one. Because this one is heaven at its best. The plan of redemption boggles the mind of scientists. The rendition here says the seed is hers. And I like it like that. Because the word of God must counter the mind of man. Prove it to be nothing. Our minds cannot understand how the seed could be hers. There's nothing wrong about the grammar there. Everything is correct. Bible critics would want to think that maybe grammar is wrong and so forth. No. Grammar is correct. The seed is hers. By the way, this does not make Mary a saint. She is a sinner. You want to connect that with Matthew chapter 1. Just to... Matthew chapter 1, verse number 2021. Beginning from 20, for it to be clear. But while he thought on these things, is Joseph, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Are we together, church? Okay. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Meaning to say, Joseph is not part of it. You know, it's always good to be with your wife wherever you are. Because some divine phenomenon can befall her. And it mustn't be hard for heaven to look for the husband. If I were to take you to Genesis 18, verse number 10, you will find God there visiting our father of faith, Abraham himself. And he acknowledges that uh, the ones that are traversing the path by my gate and not my local community man. And he invites them into the tent to come. Because this was the, you know, his culture. It was his tradition to sit by the tent door and invite them to come. You know, you need to, for us men, you need to have a powerful wife. For you to be sitting by the gate inviting travelers to come in and eat every day. You need to be having a strong, supportive wife, like Sarah. Chapter 18, verse 10. When the divine had e eaten of his food, Dr. Ndovo, when they were full, my brother, 
when they had eaten enough, they asked the husband, where is Sarah, thy wife? Praise God, it was not difficult for the father of faith to answer that one because the wife was in the tent. I see God concerned about the whereabouts of the wife, even in the Bible. The world that we are living in is challenging. I'll let you know that my wife will not be joining me soon here at Solus because of uh, what Dr. Baija has already said. She will be away for about some months because of the wrapping up that we have to do out there, including, you know, children's education and so forth. But I will have to be quick to answer when I'm asked. Okay. That was just uh, on the sidelines, but it's scriptural, biblical. The seed is has said. Already in Christ, we don't have chromosomes that we would have in, a, in you and in me. Because in you and I, there is some reactions of people. But uh, in Jesus, God only desired the vessel, so that he can put the son for your redemption and mine. As he comes to the cross, he feels the pain and the, the pressure of iniquity of us all from Adam. I just want to, you to imagine from Adam how many generations? If we were to quantify these sins, how many cages? I don't know. Loaded on Jesus. In his heart and mind, he was plunged into the collective hall of evils. Evils of man. In Gethsemane, we encounter Christ loading upon himself with the sins of man upon his shoulders. He took to himself his mental and emotional capacity, the horror that sin brings to a sinner. So as he is in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is worse than a sinner. And he feels it that I am loaded now. Divine as he is. Divine as he was in the garden of Gethsemane. Divine as he is even right now. Seen upon a divine being. What else could come out of that than horror and war? Sin was beginning to tear his veins, bringing blood out in form of sweat. For you, and for me. May I just say, my brother, you, you don't have the right to continue to carry that Lord because Jesus has already done it for you. My sister, liberate yourself. He has already done it for you. Why do you want to carry it? When somebody has already 
liberated you. Let's be free in Jesus Christ. Free from sin. We walk tall in Christ because we are the sons of God, liberated by our kinsman, Jesus Christ. Verse 39, chapter 26 of Matthew, verse 39, the Bible says here, as we move on, my dear brothers and sisters, it says, and he, he went a little, a little further, we have read this one, and he says, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Why the cup? If we had time, we're going to elaborate on the cup, but we don't have much time. You see, the cup was the cup of the wrath of God. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 10, helps us to understand that. Those who will receive the mark of the beast, okay? Okay? will drink the cup of the wrath of God, poured out without mixture. So Jesus is facing the wrath of God. Why? What evil has he done? He's facing it not, listen to me, he's facing it not as a sinner, but he is facing it as sin. As somebody says, now he was before God a lump of evil. To an extent that God could not afford to behold him. And the Jesus senses that the eyes of the father are no longer on the son. And he says, my father, why have thou forsaken me. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse number 21. The Bible says he became our sin. Our what church? Sin. He became our sin that we may become his righteousness. Praise God. He took away death. He took away death that we may remain with life. Who does not want life? He took away death. And now, we have life. The channel of life is love. Life will not exist where there is no love. If you are always angry and fighting, you are shortening your days of living. If you're always complaining and grudging, you are hastening your feet to the pit. May I invite you to be a loving person as Jesus is loving. You see, the world will not uh, uh, give us becoming situations. You see, Jesus is traversing the path which is already bad, but he, he contains himself and manages himself to walk on. The path will not be smooth for you because you are a follower of him. So soldier on, my brother. Soldier on, my sister. My brothers and sisters, we want to look at him as he hangs on the cross. You hear the nails are being put on him. Listen to the sound of the hammer. But what is it that comes out of his mouth? Is there any complaint? No. The Bible says he was led to the slaughter as a what? As a lamb, as a sheep. No complaint. But the, you see, the nails are tearing the sinews and the veins, the bones, the tendons. But no complaint. Look at you and I complaining when there is no spear near you. No nail on your flesh. But how much?
complaints rendered. We need to take after the similitude of Jesus, our Savior. The inward pain, somebody says, covered the outward. So what is happening on the outside is not much. But that, that's what he has formed our ideology as Christians. We have felt sorry for Christ because of what happened on the outside. May I help us to remember that that which happened on the outside was smaller. It has nothing to do with your sin. That which happened in his soul is a, a consequence of my doing. Matthew chapter 27, verse number, verse number 46. We are there. Verse number 46, we are reading there. Matthew chapter 27, verse number 46. Let's just get there, my dear brothers and sisters. Verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthan. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Repeated time and again in the renditions of the gospel writers. Very important. Forsaken. Because of our sin. On the cross, Christ, parent with the sin of the world, he cries from the soul, not from the pain, I mean the outside pain. No. The Lord, the inward Lord is heavier that he cannot be sensitive to what is happening on the outside. That's why he doesn't cry complaining about the nails. He doesn't groan there. They do what they want. After you had already done what you wanted on him. Here is the death that he had sought release in the garden. When he's on the cross crying for the second time, he says, Father, you have forsaken me. And Jesus feels that even before I am dead, I'm already dead if the Father is forsaken. Hence his cry is not about the pain that is engulfing his body. His cry is about being forsaken. Father, why have you forsaken? He, he doesn't say, Father, it's too painful. Ah, my sinews are broken. He says, Father, you have forsaken me. I pray, Dr. Zwandasara, that Sol Lucy will remain seen by God. The greatest tragedy that we may have as an institution is to remain by ourselves. Thank you, Dr. Nlo, for the wonderful prayer, pastoral prayer. We need to behave like people who don't want to be forsaken. As Moses was heading the ship towards Mount Hebron, there, he beheld a bush that was engulfed by the divine. The divine descended upon a shrub. Beholding the shrub, he sees something that is like fire. But it is not consumed. And the divine spoke and said, Hey, you better be careful, brother, here. The ground you are standing upon is not a general place where you can do as you please. Studuvet must not be betrayed because he is lying there. The whistles and the sparrows 
must not be betrayed. Dr. Baija, if it's time for me to leave, if it's tomorrow, you can tell me, and I'll pack and go. Okay. I have not come here to be saved, but to save. I have not come here to be pampered upon. No, but to pamper somebody, to be a missionary. I didn't share this with my wife, but I thought about it. I said to myself, will it not be suffice to say that which is a salary of a chaplain, hold it until God speaks. My brothers and sisters, we are living in the last days. We need to understand how Jesus loves us, how much he has uh, uh, done for us. It's not about my education. It's not about where I have served. I was actually saying to Dr. Bajan, oh, don't speak much about me because uh, today we must speak much about Christ. Feeling for second, he senses that and says, Father, if it's okay that you leave me. Listen carefully, church. He says, Father, if it's okay for you to forsake me, that people in Solusi campus may make it to heaven, let it be so. Jesus was ready to be forsaken for you to be saved. He says, Father, if the salvation of the Solusi body, Solusi student, Solusi community takes you to forsake me, let it be so. Ready to die and surrender himself for you. We can't afford, therefore, to behave as people who have been bought by perishable things. We can't. If we have decided to be Christians, let's do it wholeheartedly. If we have decided to be followers, let's give Christ the best. Because he gave us his best. Let me not belabor you with Psalm number 88. You can take that upon yourself to read it. But it portrays the cost of our redemption that uh, crushed Christ. <clears throat> First with the prospect of eternal separation with the Father. He valued our eternal life more than his own giving himself for others. This is what we were reading even in our courtly today. The tragedy that has befallen us is that we have behaved like owners. Human beings are not supposed to own anything. You didn't get that one. Human beings are not supposed they were not created to own anything. They were created to use everything. Even that which we give is not ours, is his. The problem comes when we think that which I am giving is my, my house, my what? You don't have anything. If you are owning anything, you are an idol. Because the owner is always the creator. The one who is using is a creature created by God. Is it not so, church? Yes. Yes. We must remain as creatures being saved by God. Appreciating the cost by which we were bought. If it meant that he would never again enjoy the pleasure of his father's presence, so be it. 
if it means that he who is what God is is no longer that, so be it. If it means being saluted by Gabriel is no more for the sake of Dube in Cholocho, so be it. Ready for anything because of love. My dear brothers and sisters, in this I see the crescendo, the crescendo of love. Love divine. Love being portrayed. The devastating endless separation with his father would not, after all, derail him from his decision to save the rebellious children whom he loved. At this point, the highest love and deepest selfishness stood face to face, and love gained the victory. Jesus could have said, Father, I can't take this, it's heavy for me. Let's sit down and have another plan. But that was going to be what? Selfishness. Love lifted us when we were sinking. In C. Highest point, highest moment. Love gained victory. You see, to me, the greatest weapon, the greatest weapon that can be used or that will be used, the greatest winning weapon, Prof. Zandazan, the greatest winning weapon is not the atomic bomb. Even the recent ones that are being used in the countries, big countries of war, you know, superpowers, the greatest weapon that will be used is that which heaven has invented and has seen fit to use. That weapon is love. Is love. As I sit down, I want to invite you to revive your love with Christ. Looking at what, at what he did for you. Looking at the cross of Christ. Can't you say, Lord, revive my spirit again? Somebody saying, Lord, reconnect me to the sense of belonging. Help me to understand. Help me to come to you. Help me to appreciate these arms that are embracing me, the arms of Jesus. If that's your prayer, stand up. Stand up as I pray. Shall we pray, Father in heaven? We come short of words as we behold Jesus. The one who put off the body of being divine in the nature of God. Became like us. That we may understand. He reduced himself to the likeness of man to help man to understand God. Oh Lord. Sometimes it appears as if even that will be difficult to work to the salvation of men. Because some of us, we have played church, we have not been serious with the issues of salvation. But this morning, as we share, we stand up for that spirit of revival, asking you to pour it upon the church of God. Touch our minds, Lord. Revive the spirit of love. Remove hatred in us. Remove fights. Make us the vessels of love as we take after the similitude of Jesus, our Lord. Thank you, dear Father, for the ministry of Christ. As we speak now, he's saving us again in the most holy place in heaven. We appreciate that. Bless the church, dear Father, our children, 
bless us here as community in Solusi. May we be always sensitive to the issues that are related with this place. Remembering that some who gave to serve died in this place so that we can appreciate the love of Christ. Thank you for what you continue to do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.